Wonderful. Okay. We'll start with our blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Venatan Lanu Et Torah To Baruch Ata Adonai Notein HaTorah. I wanted to start with a like only in Israel moment um, to share something that's happened with our family. Um, I'm not going to really we're not going to really talk about the like halachic things involved. I just want to like relate the story to you to get to the punchline. But our grandson, um, Akiva, is in yeshiva. Um, and he he lives in a dorm. And he comes home, you know, like once a week to the family and, you know, gets stuff. And Dahlia sends food for him. And like all these like teenage things. He's 15. Anyway, he had been at home and he didn't realize until last Friday afternoon, like kind of right before Shabbos, that he had forgotten to bring back his suit, his hat, like basically his Shabbos outfit. And in the yeshiva, that's a big deal. You don't like not have your Shabbos clothes. So he called Benjamin and Dolly. He's like, I don't have my Shabbos things. Dolly had just gotten out of the shower. She's like, I'll go run him over to him. So he's about a 15 minute drive. So everything was going swimmingly until there was a traffic jam because there had been an accident. And then she couldn't get to him. And she needed to be able to turn back to get back before candlelight. So she's like, what am I supposed to do? It was too far away for Akiva to like run down the mountain and come get whatever. It wasn't possible. So my daughter-in-law, who's also was like always thinking, thought, I need to see if I can give his clothes to somebody who's driving in that direction and could bring them to him. So she like looked in the different cars and saw somebody who looked like they were religious and going in that direction and just like rolled down her window. said, can you take these things to my son? And the amazing thing is, is they didn't say like, are you crazy? They're like, sure. And so she just kind of like threw his things into their car and gave them his phone number. And these people took his Shabbos clothes to him and got there like right before, you know, when he needed to have them. And Dahlia turned around and got back right before candle lighting. But I thought, I can't really quite picture driving down the street and handing somebody, first of all, you would think like, that's too weird. And somebody said, can you deliver this to my child? And you're like, it's like stolen merchandise. Or what would you think? Uh, so anyway, it was one of these great moments that only in Israel. And I don't think he'll ever be forgetting his clothes again as another additional part to the story. But it was, I thought that was really great. Hello, Shelly, and hello, Lois. Nice to see you. All right. So here in Israel, it is already Erev um, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So Rosh Chodesh Nisan is beginning. It begins Wednesday night, Thursday. And so now we are in the month of redemption. And it starts with the month and not already until Pesach. We will be meeting today and next Wednesday, and then we'll be off for Pesach and probably for a week or so after Pesach, just so we know, because we're not sure where we're going to be landing um, literally in Florida, where we're going to be staying. So I'm not sure what my, our setup's going to be. So it'll be for a few weeks, but we'll have today and next Wednesday uh, together. So I want to talk about uh, the Parsha as well as something for us to have in mind for Pesach and there. They are interrelated. So this week, the Parsha start that everybody is, if people were already like their eyes were glazing over for the Mishkan and the building, when it comes to the beginning of the Sefer Vayikra, um, then people are really having a hard time because now we get into the Korban note. Now we get into the sacrifices. And what can I say? It's very hard to relate to. So I wanted to talk about some overarching ideas that I think make it possible to appreciate the Parsha um, and the whole book, but also just to have in mind, because I think it's something that's really, I think is important that we, we, we possibly lose sight of. Um, so the Parsha Vayikra starts, um, for those of you who have the Stone Chumash, it's page 545, um, chapter one of Vayikra. That's the beginning of what in English is called Leviticus. Now, Leviticus comes from the word Levites because it's about the purity laws and being in the Mishkan and all the things, but it's personal purity as well. It's about um, the laws of Kashrut are in there. Andy, do you have a question? I see your hand waving. 
Um, but you need to unmute so I can hear you. I'm sorry, you said 545. 545. But what uh, number did you say it's on the whole page? It started at the top? Yes. Okay. It's thanks. the beginning of the book. It's the beginning of the book of Leviticus, Vayikra. So it's thanks. the very beginning. So it's chapter one of, of Vayikra. So I like calling it Vayikra rather than Leviticus. Leviticus, just first of all, this sounds like to me like Spartacus. I don't know. There's something about it. I don't even like the word, but it has to do with the Levites. And the word is Vayikra. Vayikra means, and he called. Okay. And God called to Moshe. But it's not just that God called to Moshe. It's really that Hashem is calling to each and every one of us. I think there would be a lot more interest in this book, in this Sefer of the Torah, if it was called The Calling instead of Leviticus. I'm sorry, I think one just has a much better ring. And the question is, what is it calling us to? So if you were to take a look at just the sidebar summaries, it has like the general rule of offering. It has... Well, I think it was somebody in um elevation offerings elevation offerings etc fine flour the covenant of salt peace offering sin offering um contamination guilt offering etc all of these things there's all of this stuff in here about all these different offerings now the word for the offering in hebrew is korban and it comes from the word karov which means close so if we can actually take the word vayikra and call, to be called, and it says, what are we being called to do? Ultimately, what we're being called to do is to come close. A calling on how to be close. Close to who? Close to our creator, close to ourselves, and close to other people. And how do we do that? The entire, this section here specifically and other parts of Vayikra as well are about how to come close and it doesn't mean in kind of a uh, like oh I just feel so close it's not like a, just an emotional closeness it's like how do you actually come close to anybody it comes through a relationship between love and reverence and primarily taking responsibility Taking responsibility is what allows us to come close. You come close to another person by taking responsibility for the relationship, for our actions. It does not talk about, if you were to read this Parsha and it talks about, and if this person acts treacherously and if, you, if this person steals and if this person violates this and this person does that, you see like those people get to come close. What are we talking about? I thought we were like this holy nation. What does it mean to be a holy nation? So we misunderstand that holy does not mean perfect. Holy means in relationship and taking responsibility and constantly striving to improve and to correct. So you can have an offering that when we have made a mistake, that we say we are sorry sincerely, that when we even do something intentionally, we say, I'm so sorry, and I correct my mistake, and I'm willing to accept a consequence for that. And that if I am grateful for something, that I also take responsibility and show appreciation. So basically what this whole book is saying is show up, show up, step up. And if you want to come close, take responsibility for like all the vicissitudes of life, all your mistakes, your blessings, your intentional, unintentional, be present to what life really brings a real person. There is nothing more real than the book of Vayikra because it's talking about what happens in the course of life. You make a mistake, you follow a desire, you take something from somebody, you deal treacherously, you give false testimony. We do all sorts of things that are wrong. And the answer to this isn't kick them out of the congregation and don't let them anywhere don't let them near the Beit HaMikdash, don't let them near the Mishkan. It's the opposite, that the very people who are making the errors, like bring them close, bring yourself close and reconnect. Start over, take responsibility and reconnect. And be willing to say that 
It talks about even when the leaders make a mistake and it doesn't say it doesn't say if it says when and what's the assumption leaders make mistakes. They misguide people. They do things because they're arrogant. They do things because they listen to the wrong people. They do things for all sorts of reasons, the regular human reasons, plus the added dimension of leadership reasons. It's not if, it's when. And a generation was considered fortunate is the generation who has leaders who come and bring a guilt offering, who admit their mistakes and correct them. Not fortunate is the generation who has a perfect leader. That does not exist. Vayikra is about the fallibility of being human and being okay with it. We don't need to be saved. We're not Christian. You don't need to be saved from human by being from being a human. We need to step up to being human and step into the relationship and do things to correct it and acknowledge it's going to be a regular part of living, just like you know, dusting your house. It's not like, oh. It's like whose house is whose house is clean is the person who keeps on dusting, right? It's not the person like, oh, well, my house never got any dust in. It's like that doesn't exist. So if you look and see in our Shmona Esrei, in our Amida that we have three times a day, every single day, three times a day, we're saying, Salah Lanu Machal Lanu, forgive me. You know, I, I'm saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's like, seriously, what have I done in the past five hours? I've really, I've made mistakes? Like, well, probably yes. And so the, when we understand that we're operating from within a framework where everybody is saying they made a mistake, everyone is saying that they've erred, it makes it easier to say, me too. Instead of a, a false presentation of who me, a mistake never happened. It's like, that's not reality. I think that this, Safer, this book of Vayikra is um, humbling and inspiring because it says that we're fine being human beings, but that we don't sweep it under the rug and we don't also that we don't have to live in denial of what it means to be a human being and that we have a process. We have a process for how do you get back? How do you reinstate yourself with yourself, with other people and with your creator? and that they're short of murder, intentional murder, everything can be corrected, everything can be dealt with, and everybody can move on and move forward. So I think this is really inspiring. I just think it's hard to tease that out from the des description of, you know, <laughs> take the cow and slaughter it and offer it and burn it and do all these things. It's like, wait a minute, you like totally lost me in what this was trying to do by the description of the process. But the process was using animals symbolically for ourselves. So that when we say that, that I wanna come close, we're not supposed to, we, we can't take our souls out of ourselves because that would require killing ourselves, which we're not supposed to do. So I need to stay alive, but I want some sort of representation, powerful representation of what it means to reconnect and to spiritually go up. And that reconnection looks like an animal in place of me. So we can't say in this um, book that no animals were harmed in this process, though we are sages do say that the animals came very willingly to this because they recognize that their lives were being used for something uh, that was elevated and as opposed to standing in the field and just chewing grass, like I, they would like an elevated life as well and that they came voluntarily. Um, so this idea of using animal representation, who knows what will be in the future? I have no idea, I'm not a prophet. But in the meantime, we relate to what's happening with the animal too, as if it were me. So if I want to be completely elevated, so then in that case, the animal was completely burned. So again, it's very hard for our sensibilities to relate to that, it makes us wanna just close the book. So that's why I wanted to bring in more of a, how can we appreciate and understand what is the point of all of this? And the point is how to be a human being, how to be a successful, imperfect, growing, humble human being. 
It says that Hashem Vayikra, Hashem is calling us to come close and not to let anything interfere with that closeness. And if we do something that causes a distance, to fix it as soon as possible. So that's the other thing that in our davening, in our prayers, in the Shemona Esrei, I think if you say this three times a day, you know, forgive me, and we're focusing on what is we've done wrong. If we're making adjustments three times a day, I'd say that's really good. Some people don't get around to it for decades um, of saying they're sorry, um, you know, or they have to go through a major, you know, something that's like pulling teeth to to get themselves to do that. But we create a system. We're in God has given us a system that says it's fine. It's fine. And nobody gets to skip that prayer. Okay. Nobody gets to say, you know, that person is so righteous. They don't even have to say that prayer. There's not such a thing. There is not such a thing. So everybody is, we're all in this together. And I find that really inspiring and um, encouraging that we shouldn't feel this a lot of times people feel ashamed about ashamed of what they did if it was something wrong but ashamed about the fact that they're like the only one shame about the shame and then they can't move and this says move come close i'm calling you to come close so that is the opening of safer vayikra and really covers that idea of being human as part of this of the system of coming close really leads into where we are with the holiday of Pesach. Pesach, Passover, is really the holiday where we reaffirm our closeness to the infinite creator of the universe and our story as the Jewish people, as well as ourselves, by ourselves as individuals. So I want to talk about something, and I had sent a link in Facebook most people didn't see it, so I'm going to share it with you because it's, it's. I think it's um, worth sharing. Um, this was from Rabbi Y.Y. Y. Jacobson. I'm not sure if anybody of you saw it, but it's going to relate to something that's also in this week's Parsha. If you turn to page, um, hold on one second. Ah, okay. Um, page 553. This is chapter two, verse 13. And it says, kind of, you'll, you'll hear the word that's repeated. It says, you shall salt your every meal offering with salt. You may not discontinue the salt of your, of your God's covenant for upon your meal offering on your every offering shall salt, I'm sorry, shall you offer salt. Now, if you were grading this paper, you would say repetitive, redundant, too much salt. So it's like literally too much salt. Like why the salt? So many of you have seen, or you may yourself do, that uh, especially on Friday night or for Shabbos meals, that when challah is served, that that's people put salt on their bread. Okay, the salt on the bread. Why is it? It's because of this right here. That since our table, our table is like an altar, and the bread that we have that we're eating our challah is like a meal offering of flour so that we dip it in salt because all of your offerings should be accompanied with salt. So that's why we have salt. However, the question is, why salt? So there's a lot to be said about it, but one of the things that I wanted to point to is it goes to a midrash that talks about the waters at creation. The waters at creation, and it says that the, um, the waters, let's see, hold on a second, oh, okay. Um, the Midrash gives this commentary that at creation, when God divided the upper waters from the lower waters, that the lower waters weren't happy. The upper waters got to stay in the heavens, if you will, and the lower waters were upset that they had to be like down below. And God said, okay, I'm going to appease you. And the, when water evaporates, salt is left behind. So the water, the water itself will get to go up, but what about the salt? What is what happens with it? So God is like, I will use you in the offerings for the Beit HaMikdash for the Mishkan. Salt will be used for a special holy thing. So it's not like, like what am I chopped liver? It's kind of like, what am I salt? 
what am I nothing? Like all the other water gets to go up to heaven, come back down. It's all part of a process, but the salt doesn't. So the salt um, had a complaint and the complaint is answered by the fact that salt is used. So the question is, what is the Midrash telling us? So it's interesting. If you look at each of the days of creation, each of the days of creation, somebody had a complaint. Something didn't go right. So, so what went wrong? So when God started out, is that first of all, he wanted to create and he wanted them to create the light, the light by he or let there be light, which is not the light of the sun, it was spiritual light. And then after he created it, it's like, you know, it's too much. I'm going to hide it away for the righteous in the future. And then we had the uh, water situation where like the upper waters didn't like being separated from the lower waters. So there was a fight there. And there was even a fight, it said, about the trees. So the fruit, the trees, the trees, the fruit bearing trees, not only were the trees supposed to have fruit, but the bark and the branches and the leaves were all supposed to taste like fruit. And it says, and the trees rebelled and they wouldn't do it. And so they only let themselves have fruit tasting fruit and they made their bark taste like bark because they were like, if we all taste like fruit, then the people are gonna eat all of us and there won't be anything left. It's like an act of self-preservation. Like we're not doing it. So in each of the things about creation, there is this in the Midrash, it talks about some upset, some there, you know, there's some, something goes wrong. And yet at the end of it, what do we say that every day God says, and God saw that it was good. And at the end it was like, and God saw it was very good. Everything went great. Ah, the question about um, koshering the meat with salt. No, that is not the reason, but that's a very good question. Koshering meat with salt is to draw out blood because we can't eat flowing blood. Um, so that's why we, that's why it's, it's koshered with salt. So every part of the creation, there's like, ugh, you know, how can you say this is very good? And what's interesting is the Torah doesn't say any of this. If you read the Torah, it just says there was light and then there was the waters and then there was the vegetation and then it was like all good. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Is this, who's to, why does the Midrash come along and say all of this that went wrong? Why doesn't the Torah tell us this? And why does the Midrash tell us everything that went wrong? So Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson had such a beautiful insight into this, which was those things did go wrong, but those weren't the main idea. The main idea of creation was creation and creation was beautiful. It was exactly what God had in mind. The other things happened and they were there and they're incidental to what, but they weren't what was the real story. It says, we need to understand this and learn this for our lives as well. That when we tell the story about what's happening in our lives at any point in time, or even if we talk about the past of what happened, what story do we tell? Am I going to tell the story, the Midrash story of like all the things that went wrong? Is that what I think was really happening? Or do I realize that what was really happening is the creation was happening? You can tell all sorts of stories. And one of is, and it's not sweeping it under the table. It's like there's a concept of what's the main idea and which things are secondary. When we focus on the main idea and we see what's really happening, that's going to be something amazing. And in fact, specifically when something amazing is happening is the most likely time when there's going to be all this other stuff that goes on too. So we have an understanding that says that you can't have a simcha, uh, you cannot have a simcha without something going wrong. It's just a matter of what it's going to be. It has to be, something has to go wrong. That's the nature of it. So when we know that, it's like, oh, if something's going wrong, it's not a sign like, oh, I did something bad. It's like, oh, something amazing must be happening. If you look at all the things in Torah about when there's something transpiring that is underway, then it comes along with all of these other distractions that make you think, oh, that's what's happening. So I know that's not what's happening. This is what's happening. This is the main idea. So I'll give you an example just with, we have found this apartment that we are in has been perfect for us. It has been perfect. So beautiful. So nice. 
quiet street. It's a dead end street in the middle of the city between the two busiest streets in the city. It's like, how did that happen? Beautiful view. Get to see the walls of the old city. It's spacious. It's clean. It's perfect. So now somebody else would say it was perfect. What about, you know, when your husband had the medical situation, the elevator was too small for the ambulance to get the uh, stretcher upstairs. How perfect was that? And what about the two weeks you didn't have an elevator because there was a leak on the roof that shorted out the entire electrical system and you had to go up and down the stairs for two weeks, including carrying the whatever. And then you had a week of ants in your kitchen that like got all over your special caramel corn from Purim that you had to just throw away. And then your keys yesterday for the front door stopped working completely and you couldn't even get into your apartment. How perfect was that? It's like, well, yeah, that also happened. That's not like the main idea. That wasn't like our experience. That's the, the other stuff. But what if I come back to him and say, oh, I cannot believe this apartment in the time for in just three months. Can you believe that all these things happened to us? Like, how could this happen? And then our power went out. And then there's somebody's uh, leak on the roof. They, there was a hole in the pipe. This is all true. This all just got resolved today. Hole in the pipe of somebody's um, uh, water tower thing, spraying water onto our patio, like, like, like every few hours, like just drenching it with water. Now, luckily it's been too cold out. We're not like really out there, but it's kind of annoying. So what story is being told? It's like, this is what we get to decide. Are we going to tell like what's really happening or are we going to get caught in the commentary? The commentary is interesting and we had to get call, they had to call a locksmith and they had to replace everything and the person had to go up on the roof and it was two weeks of annoyance of taking groceries, walking up and down the five flights of stairs. You know, yeah, but if someone says like, how was your time in Yerushalayim? It's like, it was amazing. It couldn't have been better says, this is the choice that we have, and this is what we call our narrative. People are so focused now on everybody's narrative, and the narrative is not a one objective reality. It is the story we choose to tell. The Torah itself is telling us that embedded in the very fabric of creation, when the most profound thing is going on, you got the water arguing with the water. You got the trees, you know, since when are trees causing a ruckus and rebelling? It's like, where did all of this strife come from? It's like, that's part of the system. It's part of the system that's happening. And the choice is, what are you going to look at? So if the Midrash didn't come to tell us what was going on behind the scenes, we might think, oh, well, that worked perfectly. In the olden days when things worked, perfectly and we've just had every, you know now things don't work perfectly they used to it's like no they didn't they never did it's part of the system and we get to choose what part we're going to tell are we going to tell the torah's version or are we going to tell the midrash you can know the midrash is there it needs to be dealt with but you get to choose what you understand uh, is the real story of what is really happening in our lives which takes us to Pesach. So the theme that I sent out was eating the sandwich of life. This is what's the sandwich of life? What's the sandwich we eat at Pesach at our Seder? What's that sandwich that we have? Anybody can- Korach. Un... Korach, exactly. And what's the Korach sandwich that we have? What's in that it's sandwich? The... It represents everything that we went through in Egypt. But what is it physically made out of? What is it that we are eating? Two things. Lettuce. Oh, oh, the, the haroset and the matzah. And the maror. The cement, the cement and the, yeah. the bitterness. And what's yes. the matzah signify? It's only the bread that we couldn't bake or is there something else in that? Something more. So let's talk about that. So it's basically matzah and maror and some people dip it in haroset, but some people do not. So it's matzah and maror, and it's called, you might remember, it's called Hillel Sandwich. Hillel Sandwich, and it's called Zecher Lemikdash, um, the a remembrance of the Beit HaMikdash, of the temples, like, what is this sandwich? So this sandwich, and you have to eat it together. It, it, it has to be eaten together as a sandwich. It says, what does that mean? 
So first of all, we've already eaten matzah and maror. We have in this ala chilat matzah, we say a blessing over that, you eat the matzah, and we already ate the maror, and now what? And now we have to put it together and eat it again. So it's like, what is that? What is that? So this is from uh, Rebbe Tanshira Smiles. Such a beautiful idea. Sandwich of life. When you eat that mar when you eat that ma matzah, we say a blessing. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has commanded us to eat matzah. And then we eat the matzah. And we make a blessing over the maror as well. Blessed are you, our Lord, King of the universe, who has commanded us to eat maror. Did you ever stop to think about what we would just said? We just blessed God. Thank you, God, King of the universe who has sanctified us and commanded us to eat bitterness. What? I wanted to thank you for freedom. I thank you for all the good you've done for me. You just told me I had to, now I'm supposed to thank you for the bitterness in my life. It's not just the Egyptians, the bitterness in my life. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me the bitterness that is in my life and commanding me to eat it not spit it out, not to make a face at it, but to eat it. This is the only day of the year where we are obligated and have the potential to be able to truly taste bitterness and bless God for it. We're told that in the future, right now, we bless God. When something goes well, we say, Hatov God who is good and does good. And when we hear bad news, God forbid, when you hear that somebody passed away, we say, Baruch Dayan Hayamet, blessed is the true judge. We don't have anything to say because it's too painful for us. It says in the future, we will make the God who is good and does good. We will make that blessing when we hear bad news as well, because we'll understand it from a different perspective that we do not have now. The only time we have an opportunity to get close to it is at the Seder where we have the ability to eat and swallow the bitterness because we have it with the matzah. Matzah, which represents in this, in this scenario, it can represent other things. Matzah, which represents redemption, freedom, and everything working out. It says when we have it, which is why the, for when we bring it together in the sandwich, it says, when you have it together and then you can wrap your head around it literally, what do we say? I can't wrap my mind around something. Basically means I can't sandwich those two things together. I can't have this pain and this redemption. That does not work. But at Seder, it can. We come closer to being able to say, I actually can eat those two things together because I recognize it's all one package. It's all one package. And my perspective is such, and it's called a Zecher Mikdash, that when there is the third Beit HaMikdash, when it is the temple, we will have clarity, spiritual clarity, and we'll have a bigger perspective and framework, and we'll have room for it all to go in. You know, you hear these stories that someone, two little Rebbe's or whatever, the first one says, the second one, when you get to, you know, Whoever dies first, you'll come back and tell me the answers to all of our questions. And so whatever, this person passes away and he comes to the one in a dream and he says, so like, what, did you get any answers? He said, once you're in this world, there aren't any questions. So in this world, we have questions and no answers. In the next world, there are answers and no questions because we have, we know the whole thing. So a Pesach is which when we have clarity about the Jewish people's horrific suffering. Why are we having a celebration? Did you ever wonder that? Why are we celebrating the Jews were enslaved for 210 years and babies' heads were bashed against the walls and people were killed and abused? Like, why are we having any kind of a celebration? We should be able to say, I'm sorry, I really can't get my mind around that. It's too painful. And yet I think everyone's making plans for their Passover Seder and they're not planning to be mourning over it. They're planning to celebrate it. How is that possible? You could say, well, you know, it's been such a long time and I don't really, you know, it doesn't really mean so much to me. Anyway, it's just a good time to get together and have a family. 
But if you stop and think about it, it's like that may be someone's personal situation, but how could God command us to do that? And how have Jewish people been having a Seder since the beginning of time? They have been celebrating Passover. What are you celebrating? It's like, I'm celebrating that I can see the whole picture. So there's a fascinating Midrash that says that while the Jewish people were in Egypt and had their first Seder, the first Seder was eaten in Egypt, matzah and maror and the Passover offering. It says that night at the table, be a great movie. They were literally transported to Jerusalem and to the Temple Mount, right outside my window in my perfect place here. They were transported there, they ate their meal, and then they went back to Egypt and then left. But that they all went. So like, what does that mean? You could say, you know, we could have avoided a lot of difficulties if you could have just dropped us off there and left us there instead of taking us back to Egypt and have us go through this whole process that we're still working on down to today. But no, but what it meant is that they were able to, they were taken there because that's the power of what the Seder offers. The power of Pesach night, if we can not get ourselves totally distracted by whether the chicken soup is boiling over and whether, you know, we, somebody spilled grape juice on the table. So in the midst of all that, to remember what's really happening, what's really happening at the Seder is that we're being given an opportunity to experience life on a different dimension. In a dimension where the sandwich of maror and matzah makes perfect sense and where we can actually eat it and we can say a blessing over it. But we distract ourselves. And it's like, who spilled their wine? When is the Seder going to be over? My guests are getting cranky. They're going to be leaving. You know, we have like a thousand and one other things we're thinking about. Do I have enough matzah? I bought too much matzah. It's like, we're caught up in the midrash of it. And we forget what is really actually happening at the Seder. So then the question comes, how can we make our seders more meaningful in this way so that at the seder we can do this and, and get there? So for even people to invite people who are at your seders, either to just personally think about or share, but even just personally think about as, as they eat maror, the bitterness of to think of something personally bitter in their lives that they're able to see had some beneficial something that came to them as a result of it. Clarity about themselves, uh, a quality in themselves that they were able to recognize, develop, manifest, something else that it led to, or something that they thought was bitter, but ended up taking them in a different direction. All of these things are Things that people, now some people have gone up to such incredible levels. I already shared with you a few weeks ago how Mrs. Palais, whose two little boys were murdered in the, um, at the bus stop, how she was able to say, don't say oof, say koof. Like, don't say oof, like, why did that happen? Say koof, which is Psalm 100, which is Mizmor le Toda, a psalm of thanksgiving. And she's like leading this people expressing gratitude. It's like, that's a level I, I can't really comprehend that level. But this is somebody in our day and age, and this wasn't something made up. This is like, I read it in the, heard her say it, you know, this is right there. But to be able to even approach that of where's something bitter, you don't have to choose the bitterest thing in your whole life, but to pick something of what happened with that and what came from it and to be able to um, eat it with your matzah and make a bracha on it. it. says that this is the sandwich of life and that when we recognize and kind of going to the same category of understanding that the, that the pain and bitterness is part of the package, all we have to do is actually look at creation. You know, God made rattlesnakes, God made poison ivy, God made diseases that kill people. God made people that kill people. God made, created a creation that also has in it all the things like, what are they doing here? What is all this doing here? It's like, 
this is the world. It's perfectly imperfect. And it's made to have both in it. And some people are like, this is, someone told us today that they think they're figuring out how to get rid of mosquitoes. They figured out a way to sterilize, um, to sterilize the whatever, so that they, they wouldn't have any, uh, could make more baby mosquitoes. I'm like, that sounds great. But then there's a part of me that thinks, I think that's great, but there's probably some role of, for mosquitoes in the world that if we like mess that up, we're going to be probably messing up something big time. But anyway, before I go on, Susan, your hand is raised. So if you want to unmute and ask your question. Yes, it, it's not a question. It's a comment. But okay. I, just read, I just read a book that I highly recommend that talks exactly about this issue. It's called The Beauty of Dusk by Frank oh. Ruth who was a, um, a yes. writer for the New York Times. And it's all, a, he loses partial sight and he's a, probably gonna lose all his sight. And he talks about people, including himself, who are able to see the good that comes out of that. So yes, I highly recommend the book. I have personally not read it. Steve read it and he loved it. Yeah, he it's very it. inspiring, very inspiring. Very, very inspiring very inspiring and you know i think that susan maybe what you even say is something that even if somebody people relate to stories you know to say we we, we, we can't sit there and give a lecture like everyone should be able to just deal with pain in their life like that's not going anywhere and that's not helpful but to be able to ask people to ah so lois is saying without mosquitoes bats and dragonflies and other creatures would lose a source of food yeah so see, like I'm very little wary about messing with the system, even though I feel like I, I personally could live without mosquitoes. I'm like, I'm not sure the ecosystem can live without mosquitoes. So yeah, I'm always a little nervous about that. Um, so I even get nervous about watermelon that don't have seeds. I'm like, you know what? I think they're supposed to have seeds, even though you have to like spit them out in that choke. Um, so all of these things are, make me a little nervous. The world is supposed to have this, but even if people look up uh, the name of the book and author is, say again, is the blessing of the the beauty of dusk. The beauty of dusk, and, and Frank, it's Frank Bruni, B R U N I. Frank, and he's he's coming out with a new book too, or else he has recently just come out with another new book. Um, so yeah. yes, and he said it's beautifully written, also uh, beautiful book. So even if people want to look up a story about somebody who's dealt with bitterness in their lives and how they approach it to share. And the reason I'm recommending this also as, um, as, as Shara Smiles also said, is to help the conversation at your meal not be mundane. Because otherwise people are going to talk about politics or they're going to talk about things that are a little bit inane. I'm gonna call on Susan and Selena just one moment because I just wanna say something here. The Passover meal itself is considered part of the Seder. It is not, we have our Seder and then we have our meal and then maybe if we have the endurance, we finish the Seder. The meal is part of the Seder. And you know, when you say the 15 things, means eating of the meal. It's one of the 15 steps, which means that we don't take a break from the spiritual focus. We are supposed to make sure that our meal has a spiritual focus, but people don't know what to do with that. People are good with it. Dip my something in the salt water, dip it in horosis. I'm good with that. Give me a, something to do. People will do it. When there is the vacuum of a meal and people sitting around and enjoying each other's company, that's where we tend to lose it um, because it's much harder unless somebody has in mind how we're going to do this. You can pre-select a sign if you were running the Seder, you can bring a story yourself to be prepared to say something that helps get the conversation focused in a slightly different way. So Selena, let me call on you first and then Susan. Yeah, there's two things. Who are we, who are we as, as human beings to start tampering with nature that 
somebody would decide that even somebody in science who's keen to make a discovery, surely they would realize that mosquitoes are there for a reason, that we can, if we tamper with something in nature, as we've, we've done always before, tampered with things in nature. Uh, we've okay. always had, there's, we always have, not, we mess uh, things up. It's like, you know, when they brought in uh, prairie dogs or whatever and squirrels here, and then it throws off the, the fox population, which then affects the bears. We, we, we never have kind of gotten ourselves around that, but yeah, things we have to be really careful. You are absolutely right. And then Susan, you had also your hand up. Where, where did you go? Okay, I think I lost Susan. Okay, um, or Susan, did you have a question still? I, I didn't know if your hand was up from maybe- No, I, I finished. Okay, all right. So having a Seder and recognizing that the meal we eat is part of the opportunity to talk about ourselves, other people, when I say talk about other people, what other people have experienced, how they are, um, have brought together the sandwich of, of, of bitterness and pain and difficulty along with um, joy and gratitude or what it's taught them, what they've learned, what opportunity. There are just some fabulous stories out there of what people have have been able to accomplish and it's it's really it's inspiring so the seder is supposed to inspire us um and the, and if we can have somewhat of a focus that allows us to say and even say like what's in your sandwich i said what's in your pocket what's in your sandwich of life the thing that, like the bitter and the sweet it talks about even you know people write poetry about the rose how is it that a rose smells so sweet and has thorns that could kill you? How does, why, why is it like that? It's like, well, because, and then there's a Naomi Shimmer song, I think, you know, um, about Israel, like that it has the bitter and the sweet. Hamar v'hamatok, the bitterness and the sweet. And to be able to have a conversation about that of putting it together and making a bracha on it. So that this is, and it's not because God wants us to be miserable. It's like, this is the nature of life. This is the nature of creation. And our goal is to be able to respond to it in an appropriate way. So just as we started off with people make mistakes, people do things that are wrong. We have negativity in ourselves. There are things that are negative in the world. There are negative forces. There are painful forces. There are difficult forces. And that's the sandwich of life. But on Pesach, we are so overjoyed with the fact that we have a perspective to recognize that it is all good. It's the only time of the year where we recite Hallel, which is the full expression of gratitude. It's the only time we ever sing it at night because it says it's not really night. Pesach is daytime, even at night. Because what does daytime mean? Daytime means clarity. Nighttime is where we don't, it's like it's a, it's a dark time. It's a time of night. I don't have clarity. It says on Seder night, it's not night. It's actually day. And so since it's really day, you thought it was night. It's really day. And so we say hello at night because it's really day. And we're really at the Beit HaMikdash on the Temple Mount. If we would only realize that that's where we were. So as we think about preparing for Pesach, in addition to getting our menus together and getting our brisket and making sure we have enough matzah and we bought the maror and all of that is to give some thought to how to steer a conversation. And honestly, if you're in an environment where that's not gonna really fly for whoever you're with, because there's limits, because all those people are gonna be there and sometimes it doesn't fly, is to at least think for yourself as you eat the maror, as you eat your matzah, and as you eat that sandwich, to really just say to yourself, this is the sandwich of life. I'm eating the sandwich of life. And to have that as a reminder to ourselves. So sometimes the main person we can impact is us. Um, interestingly, many people, when they're eating the matzah and the maror, close their eyes, just like when they say the Shema. And you're not actually supposed to talk while you eat matzah and while you eat maror. You're actually not supposed to talk because what's the problem? What do people usually do? 
they have the matzah and they make some sort of comment about how dry and you know this tastes like cardboard you know and people are joking it's like you just took the main symbol that symbolizes our freedom and redemption and you're having kind of like a silly conversation about it and the marborer is like oh don't give me so much as in that like um so that makes it really hard we get ourselves distracted so janice your question remember where can you recommend where to find good questions for discussion um a good question for discussion is one that helps people focus on their own experience or someone they know of uh, something i don't know of a particular place um another option is to tell a story uh, to read a story and just introduce it and then let it be the source for conversation. And those stories, there is a man, he has wonderful vi videos. His name is Yoel Gold, Y-O-E-L Gold. Janice, have you seen his things, Yoel Gold? So he has stories. Um, Steve and I have been watching some of his videos. They're short, but one of them we watched the other day was about a family who it was horrible. They ended up in a terrorist attack and two of their children were killed. And another child, like the parents were killed or somebody was killed and a baby was like thrown under a car, but then rescued, but then grew up without their parents. Or I don't remember the whole story. Honestly, I was just kind of inhaling it. And the child went on to become a music composer and singer who he writes songs about the joy of his life and how happy he is. And this is not somebody who's like, you know, like, I'm sorry, you're not operating with a full deck upstairs. This is someone who has found joy and the parent of the kids who passed away, the same thing. Like, so to bring a story. So I would say Yoel Gold story. Um, there was something else. It was called, uh, thank you stories to inspire.org stories to inspire.org some of them are like two minute stories they're just amazing stories that are usually things where people rise to an occasion in difficult circumstances and what people are able to accomplish and where something that was going very downhill turns around because of their attitude their approach so those stories i think are helpful because um, I think people are usually don't tend to think themselves about their lives in that way. So you don't want to put people on the spot. Um, so bringing a story about somebody else can sometimes be a good way to spark a discussion. It just introduces, even if for a few minutes, introduces a different element into the conversation other than politics and things that are not relevant to a Seder. Other questions or anything about this? Yes. Yeah, Elena. Ellen, it's very interesting that you mention about the purpose of all these physical, um, what's the word, sacrifices, because I, 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 I find that helps give it more meaning because honestly, I find it deadly boring, the building of the Mishkan and all this. Once we get past the human interactions of the first few parshiot, I'm like, how do I stay away? And then it's very difficult. There's one of the books of the Torah that deals with all of the physical, uh, is it is it Deuteronomy? I don't know which one it is, which is very hard because Parsha after Parsha, it's all about the physical construction of, and I'm like, what, what am I supposed yes. to get out of it? So yes. it's interesting that you should mention, I think maybe it's being a woman. Well, I'm just not interested in construction and building. It does, just has no interest. Even if it's a Torah thing, it's hard to keep my interest. So, so it's interesting I you say that um, because mm -hmm. the first of all, the, the construction of the Mishkan, the Mishkan is called a bait, which is very much a feminine concept. And all, every single thing in the Mishkan is symbolic, which we talked about, I think, over during the Parshas of the building of the Mishkan. We talked about a lot of them. And it's um, it's um, great to be able to, to focus on that and read the commentary, which is the best place to be. But basically, everything is symbolic. So everything is symbolic. Human beings are symbolic creatures. We ourselves are symbolic uh, of a of of God. When we said that we were created in the image of God, what does that mean? Like there are aspects of ourselves 
that represent a reflection of the creator of the universe. So everything is symbolic. Passover, the whole Seder is very symbolic, and we want to make sure that we get the most out of it. So again, whether it's for yourself only, or if you are in the position to influence other people and bring in another dimension is really uh, a, a great opportunity. So going back, and just to summarize, going back, we started off with, we're being called, Vayikra is really the calling, and it's the calling to come close in our humanness and to take responsibility for everything that we do in every aspect of our life, our successes and our failures, our wrongdoings, our good choices, and to show up as a full, sincere human being. And that's how we come close and that's how we stay close. And in that, we recognize that this idea of that there is a negative aspect is not supposed to it's not supposed to be a pro it's not a problem for us. It's a problem for Christianity. Christianity has original sin, which is why you have to be saved, because you have to be saved from the fact that there is human weakness. I don't know if it's, it still exists, but at some point in the Catholic Catechism, they make statements against the Jewish ritual of atonement. It says, like, you know, if you did it right the first time, you shouldn't have to do it again. It's a little bit like love story. Love means never having to say you're sorry. I'm sorry. Love means always having to say you're sorry because there's always going to be something that we're doing that's not right. And that's fine. That's the nature of being a person. So this is about the what is embedded in the structure of creation, what's embedded in the structure of humanity. And we actually rejoice over it. And on Pesach, we celebrate that it's all one package and that we can eat the sandwich, we can make a bracha on it and we can say thank you and we can rejoice because our perspective is such that we have clarity. And with that clarity, we have a different understanding of what's happening, that we can come together and we can celebrate the fact that we were slaves for 210 years in the most awful circumstances. But because it also comes with the redemption, we can understand the suffering even in that context and we can drink wine and we can have a meal and we can praise God. Instead of saying praise God, it's like, what kind of life are you giving us? It's like, I'm actually giving you the best life ever. And we recognize that. Janice, I see your hand up. Yes. Yeah, so um, when you just mentioned about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Christianity and the Catholics, um, I'm wondering, since the Muslims pray five times a day, I don't know that you know or not, whether that includes prayers of atonement as well. Very good question. I have to say I'm not familiar at all with uh, Muslim prayer, um, but they do pray very religiously. Good for them. It uh, says that they have something that they have on the Jewish people is that they pray five times a day. Um, and very... People who are committed, they don't care where they are. You know, um, you can, I remember one time being at JFK airport and it was time for one of the prayers and somebody took out their prayer rug in the middle of the airport and there they were. You know, Jewish people are always embarrassed about everything. They're like, it's time to pray. I'm like, good for you. So I don't know what their prayers include. I do have to end up with something that is, I think, pretty funny. Did any of you see, it was on H. Did you see about Vogue? That their their latest create their latest fashion thing, it's did you see that it's called Torah teacher fashion. It's the Torah teacher. What is it called? Like chic something. Like whoa! I finally made it into the fashion world. Characterized by high collars, longer. But that's it's called Torah teacher. That's the name of it. Of this look, and they have like this fashion show with these women dressed. I have to say, I didn't exactly think they looked so great myself, but that's what it's called as Torah teacher. I'm like, I think this might be a short-lived uh, fashion statement, but I thought it was pretty funny that it even had that as a title. So who knows? That's funny. Um, anyway, so the world is a crazy place. On Pesach, we can elevate ourselves to a place. And we also say, which is important to say, to understand, is even with the clarity that we do have, we know that it's not finished yet. 
we don't have ultimate clarity. So we shouldn't feel like, you know what, I don't really have so much clarity. It's like, that's okay. Because remember, we pour the cup for Elijah and we open the door to welcome him in. And we say that he drinks a little bit, but we don't. Okay, we can't say, you know, I have so much clarity, I'm gonna just drink from Elijah's cup. It's like, no, we don't have that yet. So what it does is expresses our trust and our confidence that there will be an explanation, there will be ultimate clarity. And even in, you know, in the, in a soccer game in Israel, when there is a tie, it's called tiku. Tiku, which means tishbi, Eliyahu hatishbi, yavo. And he is the Eliyahu will make the final decision. Because if there's a tie, who was really the winner? We don't know. Elijah the prophet will tell us. So I don't think that uh, regular soccer players know that, but that's what they say is tiku, is Elijah will decide that. So when we have the Kos Eliyahu, Elijah's cup, then we are saying that we don't have full clarity yet. We can pour it, but we cannot yet drink from that cup. We will have it in the future. And we celebrate the fact that we will have it because if I can trust that, I can actually celebrate now that I will have it. It's like finding out that your check is in the mail for the lottery that you won. You don't have to wait until you actually have the check. It's like, as soon as you tell me I got it, I'm like, I'm already happy. So we don't have to actually have it in hand when I know for sure that it's coming. So God willing, we can do that and have an enhanced celebration of our Seder and hopefully enhanced understanding and appreciation for the book of Vayikra that Hashem is calling each and every one of us to come close, fully imperfect, and that that is the, the best way to show up is as a full human being. Thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to stay on and answer anything that you would like. I was going to say about the water leaking, it's good that it wasn't sewage. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's all relative. Good. Absolutely. Well, there's lots of things. I mean, there's also was good um, that it 